to be here. It's so lovely to be with you. Bear with me for a moment. I'm shaking in my boots. I don't know why I'm so nervous. Um, it's been a while, you know. I just want to give so much commendation to, to Cairns and to Jen and to the girls who get up here. When we signed up for ministry, when we signed up to love people, we didn't realize that we were signing up for the season, let me tell you. And I just think that your church has done incredibly at standing up and serving you and figuring out how to be TV presenters when that was a lot like number 175 on the list of jobs that they wanted to do. And I just think it is amazing. I wanted to tell you a story that happened to me a couple of years ago. I was at the beach with my kids. We lived near the beach. Uh, my youngest was two at the time. And the beach that we live at, it's quite a dangerous beach for swimming. So at that time, while they were all little, we tended to just go down there and let them play in the sand and dig big holes and bury each other. And there, <laughs> there was a big slope going towards uh, where the ocean bro broke on the sand. Thank you. Where the ocean broke on the sand. And just, just behind the break was a big trench. Uh, so that's why we didn't swim there. And the waves were coming up the bank and down. And my two-year-old was standing sort of at the top. And I was filming him because two-year-olds, how cute. You just have to film everything they do, right? And as I was filming him, a massive wave came all the way up the beach so, so high that he was knocked off his feet, but he thought that he was on a slide and a super tube and he was having fun. And so he turned over backwards and he started to slide towards the ocean. But I knew that if I didn't get to him before the breaker got to him, that there wasn't terribly much hope. And so I threw my phone and just went running after him. And the wave was such a big wave that it actually washed my phone away. I didn't get to him in time, and he was taken under the first breaker. And I went running into the waves after him, and he uh, started tumbling. And the waves just came breaker, and I, and I saw him through the water, and he was about 10 centimeters, in fact, off. My fingers touched his fingers, and then he was pulled away from me. And there was a huge set of waves, and they came about seven waves, one after one another. And afterwards, it was complete calm. And I stood up, and he was gone. And there was the size of this room, there was just white foam. And I looked out over it, and I had no idea where he would, was going to be. And so I just started walking in the water. It was up to my waist. I could see nothing. And I bumped into him underwater. And I took him in my arms, and I grabbed him. And the next set of waves came, and I couldn't walk him into the shore. And I was on top of him, and he'd been underwater for a while now. And I was on top of him, and I was trying to get him to the shore, but I wasn't strong enough. I'd been injured in my pregnancy with him. I landed on the way, on the sand, with him, on top of him, and got pulled back again, and landed on top of him, and got pulled back again. There was nothing that I could do to walk him out. And eventually, two fishermen, I yelled at them. They didn't realize what was happening, because I was landing on the sand, and I yelled out to them, and I said, I'm not strong enough. Please help me. I'm not strong enough. And they came running into the water, and one grabbed me, and one pulled Tan out of my arms, and I got a shock, but he had him, and they walked us both onto the shore. And I wonder how many of you are sitting here today, and you're feeling like breaker after breaker after breaker has come over you and you're just not sure if you can walk yourself to the shore, and you're just not sure if you're strong enough, and you look at this ridiculous title, you say I am strong. You say I am strong. It comes from a song. You say I'm strong when I think I'm weak. And you're like, I don't know if it's true. And yet God does not lie, and God says you are strong. God says you are strong. So what intel is he operating from? What is he working from? Why is he saying a truth that you can't yet see? What is he talking about? What does he mean? And how amazing that God confirmed this, the scripture that I'm about to use with a word that Kate just brought. How is this, Kate? The truth that we need to know. Psalm 68 verse 11 to 12 says this, 
God Almighty declares the word of the gospel with power. The gospel in this case is the good news that there has been a victory. The battle has been won. It's over. The, it's time to come out and collect the spoils. Look at this. The warring women are the ones who deliver the message. I didn't just change that so because I was at a ladies' meeting. That's what it says in the scriptures, by the way. It says the warring women deliver the message of the victory. They deliver the message of freedom. They're the ones that run out and say, it's over, guys. We won. We won. The enemy has de been defeated. In fact, the women say this, the conquering legions have themselves been conquered. The conquering legions have themselves been conquered. Look at them flee. Now, the women of God are left to gather the spoils. <laughs> How amazing that we heard a word from Kate right now. Where are you sitting where you think, not me? Not me. The women of God are left to gather the spoils. There's been a victory. There's been good news. The gospel has come. But I'm not sure if I can go out and collect spoils. There was a word for you this evening. Did you hear it? There was a word for you this evening that said yes. Even you, even you, the warring woman, get to declare the victory. Friends, I've given this title, this uh, sermon, the title you, are, you say I'm strong, but I've given it another title as well. And the other title is The Breasted Warriors. <laughs> All right? <laughs> and listen, look, okay, I, I mean, I, the breasts can be any shape or size, okay? <laughs> but the point is... That I don't know if you've heard of some of the ancient history, the myths and the legends around the Amazon warriors. So apparently there were myths about these Amazon warriors, these warrior women. And the Greek legends have every hero in Greek times, Hercules and uh, Perseus, and I can't think of another one, Pericles perhaps, um, all these Greek heroes, in order to become a hero in Greek mythology, in Greek legend, in Greek antiquity of history, you had to first conquer one of these women. You had to first beat one of these women because they were such tough warriors. And through the, um, the years, as the legends have come, they've thought, who, well, who could these women be? They couldn't have been real women. They must have been breastless women. And so the word Amazon means without breasts. They say, say these women must have, must have emasculated, they, they must have, not emasculated, opposite word, I can't, don't know what the right word is, effeminated themselves. They must have actually cut off their breasts because they were such good bowsmen that perhaps they, uh, they, they did that in order to fight. And legend has it, they ate their children for breakfast. And these women kicked all the men out and took over, and they were the only ones, and they were all lesbian, and there was, there, it was very, very different to perhaps just the average woman next door, right? <laughs> and yet, how amazing is this? Archaeologists have discovered in recent years that these women actually did exist. They are not just myths and legends. Like every myth and legend, there were women living in southern Russia that were incredible warriors, and they've discovered these women buried with their weapons, but they've also discovered that these women were ordinary women. They had breasts, and they breastfed their children. They didn't eat them for breakfast. And they were just ordinary women, but because they had realized some of the things in their hands they'd learned how to ride horses, they'd domesticated horses before other warriors, they had mastered the Scythian bow, and so because they had armed themselves appropriately, they were warrior women. And so a little bit about you say I'm strong or breasted warriors, the point is there's something, there's a victory that has been won for all of us, and some of us are bunkering down, and we are not ready to come out. And that might be in your home. That might be behind a screen. It might be behind walls that were there long before COVID. It might be behind fears and anxieties, but you're bunkered down and you're afraid. But I want you to know tonight that you have already won the victory. You are not coming out to defeat an enemy that is stronger than you. You are coming out to collect spoils and you're coming out to war on behalf of others to 
say, come, because the warring women are the ones who deliver the message of freedom, that the conquering legions have themselves been conquered, and we can come out and collect the spoils. So what do we do in order to be those who can be strong enough, who can understand our strength, who can grow in our strength. I started a journey after that moment with Tidon in the ocean. I was devastated that I was not strong enough. And it was from past injuries and old things. And I just thought, I am sick and tired of being weak. I'm, I'm done. I'm done with being too weak. And I went back and I looked at some of my journals and some of the things that I'd been working on over the years, and I realized it was the same stuff. Year after year after year, the same problems I'd complained about, and I didn't seem to be making any progress. And it reminded me a little bit about the Israelites in the desert going around and around the same mountain. How's this in Deuteronomy 1, verse 3 to 8? I'm going to skip a little bit, but it says, In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, blah, 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 God says, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey and go to the hill country. It's enough going around and around. And my 40th birthday was two years ahead at that time. And I was like, it has been 40 years. <laughs> In the 40th year, God has spoken to me and said, it is enough going around the same mountain. And so I started journaling all about my mind, my body, my soul, my spirit. And I thought, I'm going to keep this stuff in specific journals so I can see whether or not I'm going to be making progress in these things. And I want to train myself and I want to figure out how to grow in strength in all these areas. Because how many of you know that God is not interested in only your spirit, that he sees you as a whole, and that he wants you to be led into strength and health, all of you, that he's not interested in our minds being weak, but our spirit strong. It doesn't work like that. He wants all of us, the whole of us, to grow in strength so that we are capable of fighting the battles, not only for ourselves, but for those around us. Two years after I'd started that journey, our family had the battle of our lives. And some of you know the story, and I'm not going to go into it now, but we were confronted with a, a moment where we had to fight for our daughter's life. And we had to fight in the spiritual. And we had to fight in the physical. And we sure as heck had to fight in the realm of the mind. And I was so grateful that God had been training me. God had been preparing me. God had been readying me. I want you to know, that when I say that we are victorious and that we get to come out and collect the spoils, just because we are undefeated does not mean that we are uninjured. It doesn't mean that we are unbroken, but we are undefeated. Ladies, we are undefeated. I am a broken woman standing in front of you. It has been a hell of a year. And I know that I'm speaking to many people who are feel, feel just the same way. But friends, we are undefeated. And there is a captain who is victorious, who is calling us, calling us to come out again, to walk forward again, to train again, so that he can walk us into strength. God spoke to Joshua in Joshua 1, and he said, now therefore arise and go. This is the moment of breaking away from going around and around the mountain. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, going down to the going down of the sun, this shall be your territory. He maps it out from exactly. He knew what his inheritance was. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I won't leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong 
and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that the, Moses, my servant, commanded you, don't turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Don't be frightened. Don't be dismayed. I know that there's brokenness. I know that there's injury. I know that there is a need for recovery, but be strong and courageous because God is mapping out your inheritance that he already has for you, and he is calling you to partner with him. And notice all of these things. The inheritance is mapped out for Joshua. Also, he is told he will not be alone. God will be with him. Also, he is told how to prepare for it. Meditate on the word of God. And after that, every, every uh, battle that he has, there are the miraculous things that happen. When we walk into the inheritances of God, as we walk, waters open. As we step forward, waters open. As they marched around walls without raising one sword, the walls crash down to the floor. As he goes and fights the kings, five kings gang up against him. And God stops the sun for a whole day, and then he, God rains down hailstones, and it says more people died that day from the hailstones than from the swords. God is going to fight for you. As you walk forward in strength, as you believe that he says, there's more to yourself than you know. There's more inside of you than you know. And I say that with utmost gentleness and utmost compassion for what you have been through and what you have go through in your lives. There is more inside of you than you realize. How do we give our hope for the victory, our hope for the battles that we are currently in? How do we give that hope backbone? How do we give it strength so that we can keep pushing forward, so that we can keep holding our children and running them forward out of the waves? How do we have the strength to win those battles and to gain that ground? Number one, we start with surrender. We've got a Labrador called Bear, a golden Labrador, and he is, so we've got five boys and then Bear, he's the naughtiest, so he's the sixth, and he is by far the naughtiest of all of them, and um, the others are all angels, not joking, they're not really, um, but this dog loves to run out of the gate. Because we live close to the beach, he thinks that he's a free-range dog, and if the gate opens, he's like, perfect, thank you so much, and off he goes. And sometimes I'm not home. The one time I wasn't home, and um, he ran out the gate. So our younger son went running after him, bear, 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 and then the old son said, oh my goodness, he goes, the five-year-old out the gate, so he goes running, no, tiny, tiny, bear, tiny. they run, running after him, and then the baby sits and sees the two of them and goes, oh my goodness, I think I'm, I think I'm losing the plot here, I've lost two kids, so she goes running after the whole lot of them, they run a little bit down the road, and our gardener lives a few houses down from us, and he spots this lot, and he sees that there's nobody in control here, so he goes running after them to try and catch bear, or actually he's trying to catch Elba, who's trying to catch Jed, who's trying to catch Titan, who's trying to catch Bear, and then our neighbor, who doesn't really like children but loves dogs, she comes running out to try and see if she can save the day, and with that, I pull into the road, and I look, and I think, it's like the gingerbread man. The whole town is running after this dog. It's like, what on earth is going on here? And I lean out, and I have a look, and as soon as I see what's happened, I just say, Bear, tail between his legs, and he comes scouring back. Bear. Have you got your mommies? Do you know your mommy voice? Have you got a mommy voice? Like there's a voice your kids need to know when you go, mm, no, love, I don't know. They know there's a difference, right? There must be a difference between, I really don't know. Oh, 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 come on. No. There's a difference. They need to hear the difference, and so does the dog. No. <laughs> Bear. And he comes scouring back. Sometimes 
I wish I had a mummy that lived with me that could just say to me, Jackie, enough. <laughs> enough. When I'm running around, my, my mind is running around like, to forget about a dog, it's running around like a rabbit, in and out of holes, going crazy. Sometimes it's just scatterbrained, but sometimes it's running after lies and fears and anxieties. And I'm like, will you be quiet? I can't, I can't achieve anything here. You are, you're just taking over. You're crazy. And it's like the gingerbread man all over again. And sometimes it's my body and my body's like, you know what? I really, really want that and I need it. And I just, I'm like, goodness gracious me, who is in charge here? Because sometimes my body is in charge and sometimes my mind is in charge and sometimes my soul that is just sometimes downright selfish is in charge. And then my soul doesn't get what it wants and it gets grumpy and then it's angry. Then it starts hating itself for being angry and then it goes into depression and it's absolutely hopeless. And I just think we need a leader around here. We need someone who can just say enough, bear, inside. We all need leadership. God gave us a spirit to lead our minds and our bodies and our souls. It's not equal <laughs> because God's spirit joins with our spirit. And so that is infinitely more important and more capable, not more important wouldn't be right, but more capable of leading me correctly, straightly, than the cravings of my body and the craziness of my mind and my thoughts sometimes. They're just not capable leaders. God called Joshua to be the leader of the Israelites. And he said, this, this is my leader. And how amazing is this? Joshua's name wasn't Joshua. It was Hoshua. <laughs> Sounds similar, but very importantly different because Hoshea means salvation. Joshua means God is my salvation. Sometimes we think salvation is our name but salvation is God's name. If we want to be led along a path where we are not going around the same mountain for 40 years, we need leadership for that. That leadership is not going to come from your mind. It's not going to come from your body. Well, it's certainly not coming from man. <laughs> and it's not going to come from your soul. It's going to come from your spirit, united with God's spirit. God is my salvation. Moses renamed Joshua because Moses said, this guy's going to need to know that he and God, God fo leads, Joshua follows, and then Israel follows Joshua. God leads. Jackie's spirit follows and then Jackie's soul, mind, and body follows her spirit. We start with surrender. Surrender to our spirit, surrender to God, but also surrender to the things that he's called on us, the words that he said, the inheritances that he has for us. Because how much, how, how many of you realize that you, Joshua had to surrender towards his inheritance? He had to surrender towards the fact that God wanted him there. I have been called to do this. Do you know that it is the most difficult days of my life before I'm going to preach? It is awful because I don't know if it's a spiritual attack or what's going on, but my mind is all over the place. Self-doubt, I feel like I'm living in someone else's head. It is awful. So much self-doubt. And then, not only self-doubt, but also like, well, no, you actually just think you're great. And you, then there's, you, there's this glory or shame, glory or shame. I don't know which one to feel. There's confusion. But guess what? God spoke a word over my life. God called me to something. He said to me, you will be an Esther among women. And I said to him, but I don't really even identify with women. I'm, I'm not really a girl's girl. <laughs> you know, we all say that. We all, how many of you would have said that in your life? I'm not really a girl's girl. Darn it, we are. We are girls' girls. We are breasted warriors. We are together. Do you know that Esther also thought that she didn't identify with the Jews? She didn't identify with her own people. Friends, who has demeaned women in our eyes 
that we do not want to identify as one of them. It is enough. We are women, and I am called as a girl who thought I was not to say, come together and let us be breasted warriors. Let us be those gospel-carrying women that declare the good news of the victory that the conquering legions have themselves been conquered. And let's do it together and let's be proud of it because we don't have to be breastless to be strong and to be on the front line and to be those who serve God. And so like me, I, am, I know that when you start walking into your call, that you feel doubt. I know that because I've heard the enemy's lies. I know that he says to you, no, not you, <laughs> not you. Spoils, not for you. Destiny, testimony, future, purpose, not for you. It's not true, friends. It is not true. Will you start with surrendering to the truth that has been spoken over you. Truth that is for all of us and truth that is just for you. Will you surrender to that? Will you surrender the, to the truth of that? And will you tell your mind, get in line, be inside. <laughs> Enough, because there is truth that has been spoken over you. And you know what? Of course the enemy is afraid of your truth. Of course he's afraid of my truth because it looks like this. It looks like going out to get the spoils. <laughs> it looks like going out to get the spoils. And he doesn't like that very much at all. Hope with backbone is hope that has a promise. That's what it looks like. What, what does it look like for us to have enough strength to keep going when we feel defeated, when we feel injured, when we feel like we just can't go on? It's when our hope has a promise. I know where I'm going. I know what the spoils are. Joshua had been told from here to here to here, these are your spoils. This is your land of inheritance. Your inheritance is peace in your mind. Your inheritance is a breaking of fear over your life. Your inheritance is peace over anxiety. Your inheritance is wholeness, no matter what has been thrown at you. That is your inheritance. That is what is for you. Your inheritance is that you are anointed to preach the good news. You are anointed, you, not me, you are anointed to set captives free. You are anointed to bring life and healing into your situations. You are anointed to pick up your child out of the waves and walk them through the crashing waves into what God has for them. You are anointed for that. Do you know why? The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news. Jesus said that was true of him. And his spirit is in you. His spirit is in you. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon you. Can you feel it right now? The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon you. And he has anointed you to proclaim the good news to the poor to declare freedom for the captives and recovery of sight for the blind. I believe that there has been dreams that have miscarried over this time. There have been dreams and purposes that have been aborted over this time, that have been intentionally cut out of us at this time. Do you know that I have met I know, my, a friend of mine miscarried her child confirmed miscarriage. He's now 14 years old. Another friend of mine was aborted. Friends, when God has got a plan for life, when God has got a plan for life, if he has spoken a word over you, to open up a children's home, if he has spoken a word over you, to go and speak to your neighbor, if he has spoken a word over you that you would have a child, 
If he has spoken a word over you that you will walk your teenager into wholeness and healing, if he has spoken a word over you, that word carries life. It cannot miscarry because of plans of this earth. It cannot be aborted because you are believing the lies of the enemy. Life of God carries. My second point is that after we have started with surrender, we separate with Scripture. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Friends, one of the most difficult things about walking into your purpose is that the more you walk with the Spirit of God, the more aware you are of how incredibly incredibly far short you fall. It is a crippling thing along this journey. As you take steps of wholeness and take steps into what God is doing in your life, and sometimes you're confronted with the fact that your motives were wrong, and the way you did it was wrong, and the way you said it was wrong, and your attitude was wrong. Would you rather be operated on by a skilled surgeon with a sharp scalpel, or by an unskilled surgeon with a bludgeon? Rhetorical question. (laughs) Rhetorical question. Friends, sometimes I have needed, because I have ignored the scriptures, and I have needed, God has had to send a person, and a person has been an unskilled surgeon, and they've operated with blunt tools, and they have separated soul, and and spirit, and they've pointed out things in me. They've left me so damaged, and it's taken a long time to recover. Friends, put yourself in the surgeon's hands. Put yourself under scripture. Put yourself under the sharp sword of the skilled surgeon. He will use whatever it takes but I urge you to put yourself in his hands. Read scripture. Let it, let it read your heart. Let it read your motives gently at home, gently in the quiet place. As he points out things that he cuts so deep and it's, it's painful, but it doesn't leave you damaged. Put yourself in those hands, friends. What is the difference between soul and spirit? Well, Adam was given a soul. It was, bree- it, was, it was out of the earth. It was made by God. Everything in our soul draws us back to the earth. It draws us to people. When we have cravings in our body, cravings in our mind, those are the soulish things in our lives. The spirit of God has a different origin. The sp- our spirit, sorry, this, our spirit has a different origin because it's from him heaven. It's given to us from heaven, and so everything that is from heaven is our spirit. Everything that draws us towards our own selfishness, our own cravings, our own uh, when we are inconvenienced easily, those are the things of our soul. And God is able to separate those things beautifully, not to destroy our soul, friends, not to destroy our soul. God made it. It is beautiful in His eyes. It needs recovery, but A skilled gardener will tell you that you need to remove things from a plant so that it can grow. It needs space. You'll, you'll, you'll move some of the plants a little bit further away. You'll transplant them so that that main feature of your garden can get light and soil and water and grow well. Remember, our spirit is our leader. And so God is looking to separate our soul and spirit so that our spirit can flourish, so that our spirit can be strong, and then our soul can get in line, (laughs) and our bodies can get in line, and our minds can get in line. It's not to destroy your spirit, friends. If you have been corrected and improved the way that I spoke about, where it feels like it's with a bludgeon, 
God can heal you. God will work with that. But let your spirit free. Let your spirit connect with God. Let your spirit be the leader. And speak to your soul. Speak to your soul when you've seen there are things in it that can't lead, that mustn't lead, that will lead very, very wrongly and for wrong motives and will cause damage. The more you walk into your inheritance, the more important it is that your soul is getting in line, is getting in line behind you as well. I think that when we are feeling anxiety and when we're feeling angry and when we're feeling afraid, we need to know that means our soul is in charge (laughs) because our soul is connected to the earth things. Our soul is affected by the environment. Our spirit is not affected by the environment. Isn't that interesting? Our spirit is connected to heaven, so our spirit has perfect peace. So when you are feeling anxious, it's okay. Feel that in your body. Notice it. Ah, soul, Mm -mm. get in line. Spirit, let me just give you some space. Connect with God's spirit. Strengthen, stand up straight, spirit. Now lead, lead us into our inheritance. Lead us into where we need to go. I think sometimes that when it comes to separating the soul and the spirit, and obviously Satan doesn't like that. The enemy does not like that because the enemy wants our soul to be in charge and our spirit to be weak because then we're not telling the truth. We're not telling the gospel. We're not telling that the conquering legions have been conquered. We're not sharing it. We're not bringing other people along when our soul is in charge because we're afraid and we're nervous and we're talking all things that are not going to encourage anybody to come and collect any spoils where we are because it looks like an unhappy place. But when our spirit is in charge, there is rest in our soul and there is this natural frequency that starts to happen. I'm, I don't know if you know about natural frequency, but uh, every, every object in the world has got a natural frequency. It's vibrating slowly. And that might sound like science to you, and maybe it's a bit boring, but God made science, and God created these objects. And when something else comes and vi- vibrates at the same natural frequency as this thing, you can shatter glass by singing. You can shatter glass by hitting the right frequency. I wonder what was happening in the spirit as Joshua followed the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God had a natural frequency, and Joshua joined in, and then the people of Israel joined in, and all they did was walk around the walls. They just walked, and that glass vibrated more and more and more and just shattered. (laughs) When we are walking in step with the Spirit, there is incredible power that can happen. (laughs) I feel like Satan is disarmed, but he's still got a big mouth. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? He's like, He's like tied up in the corner. He's like, his arms are cut off even and his legs are cut off and he's sitting in the corner and he's like, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. Like, what what are you going to do? Are you going to bleed on me? Like, what are you going to do? And then he, he has one weapon, friends, one weapon, and it's the lies that he tells over and over again into our minds that you're not good enough and you're not strong enough and you are defeated and you won't win, friends. You are not defeated. The conquering lesions have themselves been conquered. You are the warring woman. You do not have to change who you are. You do not have to change into a man to be strong. You do not have to change into the girl next to you to be strong. Just who you are when your spirit leads, when you surrender to your spirit, when you separate soul and spirit, and when you let the spirit lead, you are are strong. And then we walk on a journey of strengthening our spirits. And my third point is to strengthen your spirit. In these times, sometimes strengthening your spirit looks like grieving. Sometimes when you look at yourself and you think, I am so weak. I was walking with a friend of mine. She is also in the ministry. This, this week I was walking with her and she just said, I don't know what is wrong with me. I'm so emotional. I just cry for everything. And she's, she's, just, she's not like that. She is strong. And I said to her, is there perhaps 
grief that you haven't grieved because I've experienced the exact same thing. I just couldn't get off the carpet crying, crying, crying. Don't know what is wrong with me and I went away. Take some time to go away and strengthen your spirit in God and sitting with God and I just wept and wept. I didn't even know why I was crying yet. <laughs> I was crying and crying and I said, God, why am I crying? And he started to point out in me things that had happened that I hadn't grieved yet, pains that I'd carried of myself, pains that I'd carried for others that I haven't grieved yet. Sometimes strength is not doing something completely different. It's just changing your grip. It's just doing it slightly differently. It's God leading you and saying, if you can grieve, if you can let go, you're trying to walk, but you've got all this burden, all the stuff that you're carrying, that you can't be strong while you're carrying it, but you are strong. That is the truth. So lay this down at my feet, and then you will have the strength to keep going, friends. I believe there are people here that need to go on that journey. And then as you're going on that journey to follow along in consistent discipline, let him train you. In uh, Psalm 18, David says this, David is known to be a warrior in the Old Testament. And look what he accredits it to. He says of God in Psalm 18, for by you, I can run against a troop and by my God, I can leap over a wall. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. For you equipped me with strength for the battle. David is talking about physical battle, friends. He's talking about strength of body. He's talking about strength of mind, but it's come through the Spirit of God. How did that happen? He gave himself to be trained by God. He gave himself to be led by God. When we are injured, our coach leads us to rest. That's the, a very key part of training. Any personal trainer will tell you that. Rest is one of the most important things an athlete can do. And then he leads us in strength training. God can train us. As we give ourselves to the Spirit, he will train us in strength. Strength of mind, too. Strength of body, too, as we give ourselves to him. Strengthen your spirit, friends. Start with surrender. I surrender, God, to the words that you have put over me. I surrender to the truth that you have spoken over me, God. I am not defeated, broken maybe, injured perhaps, in need of grieving perhaps, but not defeated. The liar in the corner is saying things that are not true. You are not defeated. You are not defeated.